about a month ago, I started talking about transition, and, and Sue came into my office at that time and said, you know, there's some of us in this congregation that don't want to hear that you're moving. And uh, I said, well, we need to prepare for it no matter what, whether we attempt to own it or not, it's going to happen. And I think over the process, we've been blessed by the book of Acts and what it gives to us in, the, in this journey. The scripture was long today intentionally. I wanted you to hear Paul's testimony. This is the same Paul that we talked about back at last week. He got knocked off his horse. Remember the story? And now he's recalling it after all that's happened in the life of the church and after all that's happened in transition of this beginning of what we now know to be the Christian church. This is powerful stuff. And maybe just maybe you haven't been here every week or you could use a review. So I invite us to check out the screen as we get this three-minute review of Acts. In my former video, Theophilus, I explained the life of Christ in three minutes. Now I'm going to tell you the rest of the story. After being crucified, Jesus comes back to life and hangs out with the apostles. He tells them that they will receive the Holy Spirit and be his witnesses. Jesus takes off. The disciples are gathered together on Pentecost when the Holy Spirit arrives. Tongues of fire hover over them, hence the logo. The disciples speak in tongues. Peter preaches the first sermon. 3,000 people get saved. God, one, Satan, zero. The end of Acts chapter 2 is written, providing mission statements for churches in the 21st century. Peter heals a lame man and preaches another sermon. Another 2,000 people get saved. Peter and John are thrown in jail. They are released. Peter and John celebrate with the other believers and pray for continued boldness. God rocks the house, literally. Ananias and Sapphira lie about their offering to the church and are struck dead. Contributions skyrocket. The apostles preach again. They are thrown in jail again. An angel releases them. They preach some more. The apostles nominate seven deacons to look after widows and orphans, including Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. Stephen is stoned. Present at the stoning is a young man named Saul. We'll come back to that later. Persecution breaks out, believers scatter, things look bad for the church. Or do they? Wherever the believers go, they preach the word, thus fulfilling the Great Commission. God to Satan still zero. Philip meets a eunuch, the eunuch is baptized. Meanwhile, Saul is on his way to persecute believers in Damascus when Jesus appears. Saul is blinded, Saul is healed. Saul repents and begins preaching to the same people he intended to persecute. God three, Satan, well, you get the idea. Peter has a vision of unclean animals. Peter has an encounter with unclean Gentiles. He gets it. God has extended salvation to the Gentiles. Major game changer. Herod is eaten by worms. Barnabas and Paul start working together, traveling and preaching the word. By the way, I'm going to call Saul Paul now. I don't have time to explain why. Still with me? In Lystra, crowds attempt to worship Paul and Barnabas as gods. They refuse to be worshipped and are stoned. The Lystrians are a tough crowd. Paul and Barnabas survive. Paul and Barnabas part ways. Paul and Silas team up. Timothy joins Paul and Silas. Paul circumcises Timothy. Paul receives a vision of a man from Macedonia asking for help. The party leaves for Macedonia. Spoiler alert, they are thrown in prison yet again. They sing. An earthquake loosens their shackles, but they stick around to lead the jailer to Christ. Yada yada yada, more preaching. In Troas, Paul preaches for so long that a man falls asleep and plummets out a window to his death. The man is resurrected, Paul preaches some more, the man wishes he was dead. Paul returns to Jerusalem, where he is promptly arrested again. He is visited by the Lord, who assures him that Paul will testify about him in Rome. Paul feels better. Paul is transferred to Caesarea, where his case is caught up in red tape for two years. Finally, Paul appeals to Caesar and is put on a fast ship to Rome. The shipwrecks. Paul is bitten by a snake. At last, Paul makes it to Rome. He is placed under house arrest and continues to preach the gospel while awaiting trial. And that is all we know of Paul's story. Somewhere in there, he finds the time to write a few letters. Today, they comprise much of the New Testament. The New Testament is also where you'll find the book of Acts. The end. <laughs> yeah, mine's going to be a little bit more than three minutes. Um, but you get an idea of where the journey is for the church by looking at that. And it takes a faith to get there. That faith is our faith. Are you with me? That faith is the faith that has brought us here. That faith is the faith that has said, you know what, even in life's craziest of times, we still have someone that we rely on because we have come this far by that faith. We're not the ones. 
on the either end of the chasm shouting, go for it, go for it, but not being willing to get into the wheelbarrow. We're the ones that get into the wheelbarrow. And more and more I have been blessed by our journey at the United Church of Ovid when we have done just that. I have been, well, we have done but so many things that a lot of the times will split the church. Parking lot projects normally don't get done as easily as we got them done. Green space projects don't get done as quickly as we get them done. But the reality is we have a sense of faith in this congregation which overrides sometimes even our personal wants and wishes. And that totally blows my mind because sometimes that doesn't happen in the life of the church. So understand you may be unique in that way. And that's something you can share with the pastor following. It's also important to realize though that our purpose has got us here. And that's what faith has done for us. That is not my purpose statement. I did not write it. If you'll remember, you remember the board up in the back, in the back where we posted all the little sticky notes to it about what we thought the purpose was. We did that for a month and put them all together. We met with a group of 40 folks. They met in small groups and worked it out and worked it out until we finally came up with this purpose statement. And what's neat about this statement is we're doing exactly this. Now there's many things we could be doing in the life of the church. All of them would be good. But we grew in God's word by doing Bible studies, CBE groups, and all of the rest. And still our Sunday morning group meeting, even as we speak. All a part of that, growing in God's word process. We lived in spiritual unity. Amen? Amen. Whenever we made a decision, we made sure we were a part of it. I joked with you guys three months in or four months in that I finally figured out the United Church of Ovid. And the reality is we just never make a final decision about anything. And that is still true today. But it's a good thing. Because at the United Church of Ovid, everyone's voice matters. We have a meeting coming up here with it's in our all-church um, business meeting for our new pastor. There isn't just a small group of people that's invited to come to that meeting. At the United Church of Ovid, everyone has voice and members have the right to vote. The responsibility to vote, I think, is how we put it. Why is that intentional? Because we want to be sure that everyone is a part of this spiritual unity together. In this congregation, there are folks that are as liberal, as liberal, as liberal as the day comes. All right? And there are folks on the opposite end who are as conservative, as conservative, as conservative as the day comes. And there's a bunch of folks in the middle. And the way we live together, the way we make that work in this place is because we have said that we want to live in spiritual unity, period. Amen? It's important that everybody have a place. And as we make that work together. Now, in the process then, we find ways of sharing our faith in Christ as well. And that takes faith to do it. It takes faith to put it up a sign in the front yard saying, come join me at the United Church of Ovid. It takes faith to walk down a um, parade route and to share faith that way. It takes faith by passing along Facebook and email messages as a way of inviting people to what we're doing in the life of the church. It, it happens when we do um, electronic drives, and I still don't have a total. Did we get a total from that yet? I, I think it got backed up because of Memorial Day. But when, as soon as we get that total from our last electronic drive, I think we filled like half the trailer. You know, that's a witness. That's sharing our testimony. That's sharing our faith. And we do all this because, not because we just want to be busy doing something, but because we want to share our faith in Christ. There's a reason for what we do. And it permeates everything that happens in the life of our church. It's not just a statement we repeat on Sunday morning. It's a way that we build the kingdom of God, and we're a part of that process. I think it has to be the same faith that Paul had when he stood in for Festus and Agrippa. Now, what Paul did was he pulled a fast one, actually, on the system, because he was getting beat at the time, and one of the Roman guards that was doing the beating 
Um, probably, I don't know, maybe got a little bit too excited in his job. And so Paul turned around and said, do you realize I'm a Roman? And at that moment, moment, Paul claimed his citizenry, which in the Roman Empire meant that he didn't get treated the way he was being treated. And he said, in fact, not only am I a Roman and you can't do this, but I'm a Roman, and he used the legal phrase, which was the catch-all, and he said, I appeal to Caesar. And in that moment, Paul used that citizen tree to get to where he wanted to go. And it's an amazing thought process if you understand it all, because what Paul was saying here was, I'm going to Rome. Now, he wanted to go to Rome. He didn't know how he was going to get to Rome, but all of a sudden it dawned on him that if he did this appeal to Caesar, that the Roman government would make sure he got to Rome. And so by faith, Paul made his journey, got where he needed to be, taught as he needed to taught, and as in that moment on the island, or in that moment when he had the time, he wrote these letters which made it to our New Testament. All of that, though, in the process, happens when Paul comes before Festus in King Agrippa. Paul's in chains. He's in chains at his hands. He's in chains at his feet. He walks into this room. If you've ever seen any of the Bible videos or the Bible series, he walks into this room. King Agrippa is right in front of him. Festus probably to King Agrippa's right. And he starts sharing this story. This is who I was. This is how Christ changed me. And this is what's happened since that change. For Paul, he said it clearly. This is an honor for me to be able to share this story for you. The exact words in the text. I consider myself fortunate. And it can be a faith that maybe we've never known before. Over the last five years, it is easy to say, yeah, we got into the wheelbarrow, but there are times when some of us did and <laughs> some of us didn't. Amen? There are times when folks said, oh, that is just Pastor Greg doing his thing again. I wish the Pastor Parish Committee would get control of him. What is our board doing with him anyway? I don't know. But in the realities, we've had the opportunities to risk new things and to trust God in the process. When Paul ended his defense, he gave uh, the people there a chance to respond, and especially the King of River. He asked them, so what do you think? Now that you've heard my story, what do you think? Does any of it make sense to you? Maybe, just maybe, would you consider what I'm saying to be true? Now, King Agrippa, being the all astute politician, turned back and answered the question with a question and said, Do you think in just this short time you are going to persuade me to be a Christian? You remember what Paul said? Yes, but not you only. Everyone gathered here. All who can hear my voice. And I have a feeling in Paul's heart, and especially in the heart of the Spirit who is giving Paul the words to speak, that in that moment it was not just the folks in the room that needed to hear Paul's message, but that in some way the Spirit knew we'd be sitting here some almost 2,000 years later, hearing that witness again. Short time or long, Paul said. I pray that God will not only convince you, but all who are listening to me today, except for these chains. Now, for the Buchner family, we don't have chains. We have moving vans. We have boxes. We have good days and bad days. 
as we think about the process that's going to lead us up to Macosta and New Hope United Methodist Church. The reality is we didn't ask for the move. And in our conversation back and forth about the conference, the bishop actually realized, I think, put two and two together as we were talking. And she said, so, how is the move planning going? And I looked at her and I said, we are not going to talk about that this annual conference. <laughs> and she smiled and she goes, I totally understand. Um, but uh, our assistant to the bishop uh, gave me a big hug uh, as, as the conference ended. And he said, share this with your church, share this with your family. And if you know um, Bill Dodd, she knows exactly what I'm talking about. Um, they know what we're going through. That we are on their prayer list as they go and do what needs to be done in the life of the church. Don't think you're the only congregation going through it, however. In our United Methodist system right now, we have a record number, and I do mean record number of pastors retiring. And when pastors retire in our system, uh, they literally kind of move off the charts, and then uh, new pastors need to come up. That forces moves even to the point that we have another move happening at the Elson United Methodist Church this year, even as we speak. So we're all kind of in this transition. And maybe in your life, you may be in some sort of transition as well. I have to believe that with the job situation, the economic situation, all the situations that are out there, especially with storms for some people who have caused transition in here recently, that we're all in some sort of transition one way or another. And I guess what I want to share with you and what I want you to hear me say the very last moment of our time together is that our God is bigger than your transition. Our God wants to be there for you. He wants to be there for each one of us. And he is more than willing to do just that. I had to thump James on the head with the Bible at that moment because he had forgotten grace and had instead decided to go with guilt. And in the midst of his guilt, I shared with him that it's God's grace, God's grace, God's grace that moves us forward. The best gift you can give Anne Marie and I is to love Pastor Paul. And Paula. The best gift you can give to our family and even to me professionally is to show that couple what a great church this is and what it can be. That is our prayer. And on behalf of our family and on behalf of all of our leadership and on behalf of everyone in our congregation, I just want to say thank you for taking this journey with us. It was a hard first couple of weeks. And if I would have judged the whole process by the first couple of weeks, maybe the first couple of months, I would have probably got out of here like many pastors did in a couple of years. But there is something I believe it to be the Holy Spirit that said there is something still good here and there is work that needs to be done. <clears throat> I am convinced with Pastor Paul coming that there is something good here and there is still work that needs to be done. So I invite you to join with him as your pastor. Pastor Greg, as far as the present tense, no longer exists. Greg does as your friend. Pastor Greg, or Pastor Paul is your new pastor. He is the one you need to rely on. He is the one you need to call for your weddings, your baptisms, and your funerals. He is the one that you need to reach out to, even though you may think your heart doesn't have enough room to love one more person. Because I know Paul. And I know Paul. And it's going to be an awesome time. An awesome time if you allow the Holy Spirit to work in that relationship with them. 
in John and Craig. Gracious God, we have come by faith. We realize that even in the midst of transitions, you care. You want the best for us. You know more than we do. You are always bigger than our struggles. You never leave us nor forsake us. But you can be trusted. Thankfully, you are not finished with us yet. And that the journey our family has made for the United Church of Ovid family has been an awesome journey of faith. But that reliance on faith doesn't have to end, nor should it. As the moving van arrives to take our stuff away, and as Pastor Paul and Paula's van arrives a few days later, help us to remember that this too can be done in faith, that this too is a part of your greater plan for your lives, and that this too is a part of your kingdom journey. Help us to realize that every transition that we go through in our lives is a matter of faith. Every transition is a faith matter. Help us to not only come this far by faith, but to continue in faith until we are taken home or Christ calls again. We pray this in his holy name and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are going to share in communion this morning. We are going to share it in the pews and we invite you to take it when it is passed and then hang on to it until it all been served. You do not need to be a member of this church or of any church to share it in communion this morning. And what you do need to have is a part of you that says, I want to live in closer relationship with this Jesus Christ. 